My name is Amy Ray. I'm a clinical instructor here at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. I am an infectious diseases doctor and I work for university hospitals. In that regard, I also um, am the chairperson for infection control for the UH system. Swine flu, or H1N1, is an influenza virus. So every year, um, we are exposed as a population to influenza vi viruses. In the United States, it's a seasonal exposure. So generally, the season is from October through March. The swine flu is a little bit unique in that um, this is a new virus, one that we have not seen in patients before. Uh, and because of that, because of its newness, and it's, uh, it's a little bit unpredictable to us. So historically, looking at influenza viruses, um, they contain genes from a variety of different sources. They can have avian or bird genes or genetic makeup. They can have swine or pig genetic makeup. And then typically what we see year to year are human influenza viruses. The thing that's so unique about this virus is that it contains components of both swine, um, bird, and human genes. Every two or three years, the CDC does report one or two cases of swine influenza, and those patients who become ill have contact with pigs. The thing that's different about this virus is that um, though it probably started in pigs, there is sustained human-to-human -human or person-to-person -person transmission. One of the questions that's commonly asked is how this virus entered our population at all. And it's important to note that every couple of years, the CDC, or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, report one or two cases of swine influenza. In general, those cases have been transmitted from a pig to a human, a human who has contact with swine. For this virus, however, what we're seeing is sustained human-to-human -human transmission. So the vast majority of cases in the, in the United States currently have had no contact with swine, and the vast majority also have not traveled at, to endemic areas. Endemic means that we're seeing cases within a pre-described area. So for example, the states in the United States that are being hit hardest with this virus are California, Texas, and New York. So to some degree, those communities are what we might consider endemic um, for the virus. This virus is creating concern among health officials primarily because unlike our seasonal influenza where we have vaccine available, our population is at risk of this disease because we have no preformed antibodies. Antibodies are the body's homemade tools to prevent infection and the goal of vaccination every year is to generate your own protection, your own antibodies against viruses that come around seasonally. Because our population has not been vaccinated for H1N1 swine influenza, we are at greater risk, um, although the, so far the disease has been mild. As transmission continues, however, uh, patients will develop antibodies to this virus and will hopefully achieve some level of immunity. In addition, I would anticipate for the 2009-2010 influenza season, I would anticipate um, we will cover this, vac cover this virus in, in seasonal vaccination. In general, if you're a healthy person, your risk for severe disease with complications is in incredibly low. This will be um, just like getting seasonal influenza, a little bit more severe than um, a upper respiratory tract infection. And healthy humans can fight this virus. And there should be some reassurance in that fact. It's the patients whose immune systems are already compromised or have chronic underlying um, disease, in addition to very young and the very old um, patients, as well as pregnant women. Those are the patients who are really at risk for severe influenza. And in general, the healthy part of our population uh, should take some reassurance in the fact that the disease has been mild. If someone has symptoms of influenza, uh, if the symptoms are mild, and for the most part for this, this swine or H1N1 influenza infections, this, the cases have been mild here in the United States. If the symptoms are mild and are treatable with over-the-counter uh, pain medications, 
then the recommendation really is for the patient to stay at home and, and minimize contact with, pu with public settings. However, there are patients who are at high risk of complications of influenza, and those patients would be patients with chronic heart or lung disease, uh, pregnant women, uh, anyone who is immunocompromised, meaning a transplant recipient um, or an HIV patient. Those, if the symptoms develop for high-risk patients, they should seek medical attention immediately. If you are a patient and you have no high-risk conditions but you're having symptoms of influenza, if, the, if your symptoms are progressing and, and worsening over the course of 48 hours to 72 hours, I would recommend seeking medical attention. Well, the treatments for this um, H1N1 influenza are Tamiflu or Relenza. And we are fortunate in that so far this virus is susceptible, meaning it can be treated with either one of those drugs. Uh, doctors may want to treat patients who are particularly are at high risk for complications of influenza. And in addition, doctors may choose to treat contacts, such as household contacts, who are high risk if they're caring for a loved one with this infection. So the way that you present, prevent swine flu, stay home if you're ill, first of all. If you're in public, um, please wash your hands very frequently and always before you eat. Um, cover your cough and make sure you, after you dispose of your Kleenex, you again wash your hands. Soap and water is fine, but keep in mind the adequate hand hygiene with soap and water is 15 to 20 seconds long. The alcohol-based hand products are adequate and appropriate to prevent this infection, and in addition, they can be carried easily um, as you're going about your daily travels. At this time, there is no vaccine to prevent H1N1 swine influenza. However, there are prophylactic antiviral medications that can be considered if the patient is at high risk for complications of influenza. An example would be um, an adult with asthma taking care of a child with confirmed disease. That adult may qualify indeed for taking a medication to prevent the development of infection. So the primary points of pre prevention really are hand hygiene, cough etiquette, um, and staying home while you're ill. Prevention is really the key. So staying home while you're sick um, is important. And basic hygiene practices also are important. So if you're taking care of a loved one who's ill, what are some practical things you can do? Make sure that their clothing and linens are washed in, in hot water. Use just over-the-counter disinfectants to keep your surfaces clean. Influenza virus can live a number of hours to days on surfaces, so it's important if you're touching objects um, that an ill loved one has, has been handling to frequently use hand hygiene. That is your primary cornerstone of infection prevention. The possibilities for what could happen with this epidemic. Um, it's important to keep in mind that every year seasonal influenza causes 36,000 people to die in the United States. So right now we're, we're looking at two deaths from H1N1 swine influenza in the United States. It is widely anticipated that our case numbers will continue to rise. There's no slowing of transmission as of yet. 41 states of our 50 have had confirmed disease. However, it is too soon to know what the time course of this epidemic will be. I think my advice for the general public in thinking about this epidemic is to just keep a cautious concern and keep your eye on the ball in terms of if you're traveling. Please check the CDC website for travel advisories. Um, at this time, it is too soon to say how this will play out in our nation, but keep in mind um, that we are not at a state of alarm nor panic. We are uh, promoting good, safe practices for disease pre prevention.